Hi, Jenny. Hi, Trisha. Nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for running this event. I just texted you, by the way, but it ain't irrelevant oh. now. Oh my gosh. My, why is my phone? Oh yes. Yeah, sorry. My, whenever my laptop is on, my cell phone decides not to give me any notifications whatsoever. So yes. Hi, Rashma. Go. Oh, I think you're muted. Yes. Hi, Rashma. Hi, how's it going? Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Ginny. Nice to meet you too. How's it going? We are so glad to have both of you tonight. Yeah, wow. so exciting. I'm well, I'm well, Rashma. I'm, uh, it's been a, it's been a kind of a busy week with graduation last week to the I book. I know, I week. missed it. I was supposed to, we went up, we were, we were away, but I was there for the first couple of days. So how was it? It was so much fun. It was so nice. Yeah. Everyone came back together in the yard and it was really special. And yeah, it was um, really my parents were down there and it was just, it was a great time. <laughs> That's so amazing. That's so yeah. great. You deserve it. So what are you up to? Where are you, what, what's going on now? Give me the short. The short is uh, in the fall. I was really, I was really blessed. I was named a Rhodes Scholar, so I'll be off. Oh to my! Oxford how did I miss this? To graduate school. <laughs> oh uh, my gosh! How did I miss this? This is incredible. Thank you. Thank of you so much. Of course you were. Um, where are you going to grad school? Oxford. Ah, so. I was just there. I did a debate there. Oh yeah, I saw that. How did that go? I saw oh, that on. I that was so, on Twitter. I, I you. I that place is just magical. You're it, have, yeah, that's what I've heard. <laughs> it's it's spe so special. You're gonna have such an amazing time. I'm so, so people have told me that it's kind of like magical, Harry magical. Potter esque, super incredible people, amazing conversations. Oh, totally all that. beautiful. So, Not that far from London. Ugh, it's so so what are you gonna be studying? The first year I'll be doing a master's in internet studies, so focused on internet, yeah. IT technology, how can we engineer better solutions for a better digital world? And the second year I'll be doing an MPP. So <laughs> that's what my debate was about. Oh, was it really? Was, what was yeah. it about? It was about basically the end of big tech. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. We'll get into that another time. <laughs> Hi, <Yeah>. Lydia. <laughs> uh, hi, Trisha. Hi, hi Jenny. Hello. Hi, so yes, good to I see everyone. I let Olivia sneak in early here, so yes. we know her. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> Congratulations, oh. Trisha, on everything. Thank you. Thank you. So, so much. you just graduated. Just graduated like yourself. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's amazing. Um, I'm like adding, like I, I took your bio and I just wanted to kind of shorten it down a little bit just for our introduction tonight. The whole thing has been listed on our, on our, our ticketing site, our website, but um, now I'm adding, like, she's also a Rhodes Scholar. She is from Meterville. <laughs> how did, she how did just graduated. This? I cannot even believe this. This is so amazing. I need to now find it. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, no, it, it was very, very surreal and very special and very unexpected. It was also the weekend of the Harvard Yale game. So no one was on campus. It was completely, I mean, I, I got it and there was no one there to celebrate <laughs> with. It was so, it was so quiet and, and desolate, but it was, it was really awesome. And I was just, I called my mom and she was just shocked. <laughs> I think, I think the first thing she said was, oh my gosh, you're going to have a British accent when this is all over. I said, oh my I, said I don't think that's going to happen, mom. <laughs> but we can try, right? Can try. <laughs> exactly. And this was like last year. I cannot, I'm looking it up. I cannot even believe I missed this. Why do you, ah, this is amazing. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. And are you still, are you, I have in your bio that you are 20. Is that still accurate? I am a 22. I actually had a birthday also. In time, so. <laughs> well, a couple of them, apparently, according to my bio. So yes, yes. So 22. Awesome. All right. Um, I'm going to add that in. And it's Trisha Prabhu, right? Correct. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And Rash Misogyny? Sajani. Sajani, sorry. How are... Um, Sean and Sai doing? Everybody is great. Every bit was going on. Um, everybody's great. I did a, I did the Yale commencement speech last week. That was I saw. Fun. I saw. I had so many people texting me like, "Oh my God, she's coming! She's coming!" Uh, I was like, <laughs> "I'm jealous." <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, you had did Jacinda do? She Jacinda did the one before. Who's your guys' speaker? Michelle Wu, which was amazing too. I mean, I'm yeah. not complaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was incredible. How was she? She, she was, was really, she talked a lot about, actually, this was the key theme of both Jacinda and Michelle Wu's speech was they talked a lot about missing disinformation. 
Um, yeah. To be fair, it ties into the whole Veritas truth. Yeah, yeah, motto, yeah. But yeah, it was interesting. That was, they talked about big tech a lot. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was fun. And then I, it was just such a big, as you can imagine, I was just, I, I took it very seriously. Yeah, so yeah, basically yeah. For six months, I spent like writing it, thinking about it, what I want to say. And so like that kind of, and it went off great. It was really hot though. It was like 85 degrees. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which was like pretty brutal. I was like, yeah, right, yeah. Death, like somebody just, um, but, but that, so that was nice to kind of have it over with because I just yeah. feel like, but yeah, I'm just building my next organization, you know, still doing a lot of work for girls who pay code. up, pay up. Yeah, I'm such, still on a perpetual oh. book tour. Um, but, and looking forward to like the summer and, um, having some creative space to just like mm. think about some things I, I want to build, um, building what a mom's union could look like and mm -hmm. um, how do you start organizing women and moms in workplaces um, and thinking about what that looks like, that could look like. And so that's fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Oh, I'm so, so are you going to take the summer off? Please tell me you are. Somewhat. Yes. I, I'll be spending um, some of it with my parents, some of it with my partner in California. So it's kind of a, it'll be a little bit of a split. And now, what's your partner up to? He is actually going, he's also going to graduate school, but he's going to China. Um, so he's doing the Schwartzman Scholarship, if you've, if oh, you've wow, heard of yeah. that. It's very new, but he's getting his um, master's in foreign affairs there. And it's, the goal is, you know, to send American youth and American leaders to China so they can learn more about the country and then come back and not have, we kind of have a very one dimensional understanding um, of China. And so the goal is to try and get a, a, a broader understanding of the country. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. That's I'm very excited deal. for it. So yeah, lots of exciting, exciting oh. stuff ahead of us. <laughs> How long have you guys been together? We've been together all throughout college, actually. So, uh, <laughs> so is yeah. He, so my is he busy? Mom, sorry, is he brown? He's not. He's white. So, but my parents are are on board. Are okay my with parents it. are yeah. on board, so, just, so it's all good. <laughs> and you met at Harvard? Yes. Yes. Okay, I don't even know what the two of you are going to do when you hopefully make the world a better place. Ah, uh, wow. Oh, seriously. Indeed. Indeed. Well, um, this will be great because clearly you guys, you're just going to just <laughs> talk and <laughs> change the world with your conversation. So um, I will do very little but be in the background here um, when we get started in a couple minutes just to let you guys kind of know our format. Um, I'll let everybody in right around seven, um, do a quick intro um, just of the store, a couple other things we have coming up, um, introduce both of you, and then um, I'll disappear, but I'll be here in the background, of course, and um, let you guys chat for as long as you'd like. I can come back on for the Q&A and feed you things from the chat if you would like, or you are more than welcome to, to dive in there yourselves, um, whatever you prefer. I can manage it. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so then I'll just kind of pop back on um, as things are winding down or a little bit before uh, eight o'clock central time, um, just to kind of wrap up and, and thank everybody for coming on our behalf. And then we, yeah, be shoot for about an hour or so. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. And thank um, you so much, Reshma, again. I can't thank you enough. Oh my God, of course. So excited. I was like, my dream person <laughs> is doing this with me. So thank Anything you. Anything for you. Um, and... Jenny, you're going to do the, her bio, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. I, I kind of, if it's okay, I kind of condensed it down a little bit, Trisha. Okay. Um, perfect. Yeah. 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 Perfect. I'm happy to read the whole thing if you want, but it, it's very long. So I, I think that, cause I've seen you know, it and it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have, it's yeah. incredible. I mean, you have so many well, accomplishments. But it, you know, it tries to cover like 10 years of my life throughout my childhood and everything, you know, so yes. I yes, yes. All right. Yep. Well, then, I did have to add that you're from Naperville. So <laughs> of course, of course. And Reshma is actually also <laughs> from her, Illinois. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Okay, amazing. Yeah. So and I was, Reshma, I don't know if you know, I was born in Arlington Heights. So I was oh, wow. Look at my this. parents lived in Shopper <laughs> for three years. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, is there anything you wanted me to add? Um, me? Yeah, question wise. Oh, um, I added a couple to the ones that I sent you just with the focus around because I think this ties into kind of, you know, a lot of the shared work that we've done, just the way that diversity can translate to a better internet and the need for, you know, yeah. more women and people of color to be solving these challenges because they often disproportionately affect those groups. Um, no, I think otherwise the list look, look good to me. And, and I mean, whatever, I mean, you know, 
if anything comes up during the conversation that you feel is yeah, good. Yeah, I'm going to just flow with it. This just is flow great. with it. Yeah, totally. Cool. I'm good with that. Yep. Awesome. Amazing. Um, we do have the recording on just so you guys know, just for yep. in, in a, like a month or so, or when I get to it, but no sooner than that, <laughs> this will go up on our website an unlisted link just to have as a, a recording of the things that we have all done. Um, we're more than happy to send that link on if it's something that either of you would like to use for anything. Um, but it's not like being live, you know, broadcast out to any other platforms or anything. So it's just open to those who registered. Awesome. Sounds good. And I think, do I have book plates from you, Trisha? Slash Olivia? I don't think you have book plates from me. What, what am I? I can send. I can send. Okay. I'll send them to you, Trisha. Look okay. at the address. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I did them when I was on. in Pelham with Kristen. So I can yes. just do, yeah, do them again. Yeah. Okay. I'll thank send you. you more. Okay. Thank you. Um, that would be great. And Olivia, we can connect about that. Yeah, afterwards absolutely. too. Um, yeah. So, are you both on the east or on the east coast now, Trisha and Rishma? Okay. I'm actually back home in Naperville, so I'm I'm oh, here. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. Well, welcome back. <laughs> That's awesome. And you're in New York, I guess, right, Rishma? Oh yeah, in my <laughs> beautiful apartment. It looks the, it's gorgeous. Thank I love you. I've, I've had to like work on my setup here. You do not see the rest of it. So <laughs> it looks, well, I've seen it on Twitter a couple of times. I'm a yeah. huge fan. <laughs> yeah. So Amazing. this is it. Oh, Problem is it's like hot in New York. That's about to turn the air conditioning off, which is right here now. So that becomes oh. a problem. But it's how fun. hot is it right now? It was so like hot 95. today. It's yeah. Hot. Really? Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, it was 95 today. Very hot. Oof. Tomorrow Oof. that's to be cool again. So that's good. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that's not day. cool. We had a stretch of that um, the middle of May. It was it was like ninety some degrees here for like three days. It was completely bizarre. Wow. Um, yeah, and then I went to Georgia where I was. That's the norm there. So they were like, "Oh, it's everybody was so so hot." I'm like, "Well, this is what it was like at home when I came here." But it was the strangest thing. Yeah. We've never had heat like that in May, or I can remember. But yeah, craziness. So all right, well, we've got some folks waiting. So if you guys are ready, yeah. we will kick sure. Olivia off screen. Though we okay. love your face, Olivia. And I'm ending it, right? <laughs> oh, I can end. I'll come back on to oh, end great. the actual thing. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So like, I'll see your face and I'll stop talking or we'll stop talking. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll come back out and we can, I'll just, you know, say, oh, okay. it's been so great to have you all. And if you've got books and blah, blah, you know, we'll ship them okay. to you, blah, blah, that kind of wrap up stuff. So. Okay. But good okay. to see you, Olivia. Good to see you. Congratulations, Trisha. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you so much for everything. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Rashma. So nice to meet oh, you. Welcome. So nice to meet you <laughs> Bye, Jenny. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Olivia is the best. We've been working together for a long time. <laughs> and all right. So now I will go ahead and let everybody in. All right. Go ahead and let folks in here. I know there's that moment when everybody is joining that you're connecting to audio. So we don't want to officially start until you've all connected there, but welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Ginny and I am with Anderson's Bookshops. We'd like to take a moment to thank you for being with us tonight. We are very grateful for your support. For those of you who are not familiar with us, Anderson's is an independent bookstore outside of Chicago in Naperville and Downers Grove, Illinois. We've been owned and run by the Anderson family for six generations now, which makes us the oldest single family run bookseller in the country. And as of this year, we are now proudly 100% woman owned as well, which is very amazing to us and rather fitting for tonight, we think too. Uh, we are pleased to offer you both virtual and in-person events right now. So please visit our website, which is andersonsbookshop.com or any of our social media pages to learn more about our upcoming events, including uh, Catherine McGee, Michael Liali, Noodle the Dog, which is gonna be very fun. If you've heard of Bones Day or No Bones Day, that's from Noodle, uh, as well as David Sedaris is coming back to see us again. So um, tune in for those. A quick accessibility note, we have turned on the live transcript feature. So if you'd like subtitles or a full transcript as provided by Zoom, you can choose that using the live transcript or CC button at the bottom of your own screen. But tonight we are thrilled, especially thrilled, I would say, to welcome a Naperville native uh, back to the area, uh, Trisha Prabhu, for the release of Rethink the Internet, How to Make the Digital World a Lot Less Sucky. Uh, please welcome the author, Trisha, and I'm gonna read um, a, a bit about her, which is 
I'm going to tell you a very condensed version, but it is so impressive. Um, she's a 22 year old innovator, social entrepreneur, global advocate, and inventor of Rethink, a patented technology and an effective way to detect and stop online hate. As a victim of cyberbullying herself, Trisha was shocked, heartbroken, and outraged. Deeply moved to action by the silent pandemic of cyberbullying and passionate to end online hate, Trisha created the patented technology product Rethink, which detects and stops online hate at the source, before the bullying occurs, before the damage is done. She is the first ever Harvard College freshman to win the Harvard University's President Innovation Grand Prize and is also the proud recipient of many many other awards, like two paragraphs more of awards. And as of last week, she can add a uh, Harvard graduate and Rhodes Scholar to that list. Um, but as I mentioned, she's originally from right here in Naperville. So Trisha, we're so glad to have you. Thanks for being with us. Oh, here, I'm gonna go ahead and fix that. There you go. Sorry, there you are. Should Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so yes. much for hosting. And um, excited because we can do this in a virtual format. We're so happy to have Reshma Sajani with us as well, who is a leading activist and the founder of Girls Who Code and the Marshall Plan for Moms. She has spent more than a decade ad advocating for women's and girls' economic empowerment, working to close the gender gap in the tech sector, and most recently championing policies to support mothers impacted by the pandemic. Sajani is also the author of the international bestseller, Brave Not Perfect, and her influential TED Talk, Teach Girls Bravery, Not Perfection, has more than 5 million views. Also originally from the Chicago area, she began her attorney, her career as an attorney and a democratic organizer and now lives in New York City with her family. Thank you, Reshma, for joining us as well. Oh, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here um, and to be here with Trisha. I'm so excited to moderate this conversation with you. Yes. Well, um, judging from the beginning of our chat before we got started online here, you have a lot to talk about. <laughs> I'm going to let you guys have at it. Well, first of all, I don't know how, even how long we've known each other. I feel like forever, but I have been watching you, time. Yes. <laughs> you on, rooting you on. And yes. it's so funny. I was actually just having coffee with a friend of mine and we were talking about the state of the world and what it's going to take to change. And we were both saying, gosh, we, need, we just need to activate young people and young women in particular all across the country to start building movements and making change. Yes. You're ex that's exactly what you've been doing. And ex you're, that's why I'm just, it's an honor for me to, 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 men you know, to be one of your mentors, to be one of your supporters and one of your advocates, because um, we all need to invest in your leadership because you're going to make an enormous amount of difference in the world. And so congratulations on your new book and um, on everything that you're about to do. So why don't we start talking a little bit about you? Who is Trisha? How did you become passionate about being a change agent. And um, tell me about what inspired this book. First of all, thank you so much, Rashma. I mean, I've said it before and I'll say it again. You are the best mentor, um, personally, my my role model and hero and everything um, because you are an activist um, and you have created movements that have inspired other people to create movements. I am a proud member of Girls Who Code. I've been impacted and shaped by Girls Who Code. I've had the chance to teach Girls Who Code classes and I've seen the kind of power um, that this empowerment of women has. So I'm just immensely grateful to you. And I know I'm speaking for a lot of women when I say that. So thank you so much for being here with me. It's, it's my honor. Um, who is Trisha? Um, I am a 22 year old activist and inventor um, originally from Naperville, so I grew up in the suburbs here. Um, I'm an only child, um, was born and raised here, and then had the privilege to go off to Harvard um, to complete my bachelor's, um, which I just did last week, um, which is so exciting. And uh, my, my journey into the anti-hate world really started when I was 12, 13 years old. Um, I had had experiences growing up um, where I had been bullied, I had been cyber bullied, I had been targeted, um, and so, I understood the feeling of being isolated, being alone, um, being hurt uh, and harmed. And then when I was 12 and 13, that's when I started to read news articles and learn more about the fact that cyberbullying was this issue affecting youth all over the world. I had thought for a long time, it's a me thing. It's a me problem. I'm being targeted because there's something wrong with me. It was only later that I realized that this was a silent pandemic that was affecting so many youth um, and often indiscriminately and it just broke my heart. It was heartbreaking. The other thing that really frustrated me is I thought a lot of the solutions out there, just trying to put a Band-Aid on the problem, you know, just trying to encourage victims to talk to someone after it happens. And I thought, we can do better than that. Um, by that time, I'd be, become really passionate about technology. And so technology just me said, okay, 
I'm going to solve a problem technology created by turning to technology. And that is what gave birth to Rethink, um, which is a patented app that detects cyberbullying before it's sent and then gives users a chance to rethink. So it goes, whoa, are you sure you want to post that? And we found that it's incredibly effective at stopping cyberbullying before it happens. So I've been doing this work. I've been doing this work for many years. And along the way, I had the chance to meet with youth. I've talked with so many youth you know, over the nine years I've been doing this. And the theme that came out to me is, wow, this generation is so tech savvy, but they're not digitally literate. So many youth you know, know how to use a phone, but they don't understand the concept of digital citizenship or digital footprint, or even how to manage screen time. And so many of them wanted a vision of what the right practices and behaviors for the internet were like. They were like, I want a survival guide to this world that I've just kind of been thrown into. And so it was a culmination of a lot of that and then me wanting to create that vision that ultimately led to the book. That's so interesting. Okay, I wanna break a couple of those things down. So one, this was 10 years ago. Yeah. And 10 years later, has things changed? Have things gotten better in terms of cyberbullying, just generally in the in like in the country, in the world, or have things gotten worse? Um, I would say, unfortunately, things have gotten worse. I think most experts agree that that is the case for a number of reasons. One, you have a lot more youth on the internet than we did ten years ago. Um, you have them also at younger ages on the internet. I was just at an elementary school earlier today talking about rethink the internet, and I'm asking like nine year olds, "Do you have a phone?" Every hand goes up, right? Because that's just our new reality. That wasn't the case ten years ago. You know, when it was more thirteen or fourteen year olds that were you know having consistent screen time. The other thing we've seen is a real change in the kind of content that we see on the internet. Ten years ago, it was a lot of text based content. Today, we see a lot of images and videos, and so that's created new avenues for even more tricky and insidious hate, right? So offensive memes is a huge one now. We've seen memes that are racist, that target religions, that are really hard and actually evade content moderation practices by um, social media companies. So in that sense, cyberbullying has gotten worse. I like to counter that with the fact that we've also seen the rise of great movements to tackle cyberbullying. We've seen decreased stigma around the issue, which I'm super proud of, right? People are a lot more open um, to the fact that this is a problem, that it's mental health effects, you know, is a problem um, and wanting to solve that. And of course, a lot more social media companies, big tech are willing to own that this is an issue that they have to work on. 10 years ago, I don't even know that they would admit, uh, you know, that cyberbullying was something that was on their platform. So I think there have been some strides forward and some steps back. On the whole, though, I think now more than ever, it's just so, so critical that we're tackling this issue. So I, you just said something very interesting. I haven't thought about it from that perspective about like now it's also about teaching people how they can actually uh, regulate the way that they're using yes. technology in the Internet. Because when you think about it, we think it was basically I'm going to stop myself exactly. from bullying someone else rather than I'm going to actually teach myself how to limit potentially my exposure. Mm -hmm. or my engagement, how did that come to you? And what's the, you know, do you feel in some ways that that's a new tactic or a new way of, of, of thinking about this? Totally, you're hitting on something that was so key and core to my work and what really pushed me in this direction was 10 years ago. And certainly to some extent today, there is still very much a focus on, can we limit exposure to content, knowing that content is gonna be out there. For me, my theory of change is not just, can we stop cyberbullying? but can we create a fundamental shift in internet culture? And as a young person, when I started this work nine years ago, like all young people, I was optimistic and I was angry. I thought we shouldn't have to settle for you know, content on the internet that's bad, but let's just put the blinders on. I thought that's not getting at the root of the issue, right? The root of the issue um, are youth often who on the internet, not looking at someone's face, um, are much more willing to say something offensive. And then those behaviors translate, right? from the offline to the real world. And we've seen that with so many hate crimes in the last few years, right? That start with the planning online, with hate online, and then that translates to the real world. So it's not enough for us to just put the blinders on. We have to actually target this problem at the root. And for me, that's what's really driven my work with Rethink and what, what got me into that direction. Yeah, and, and do you have more hope for that than like, you know, I, I feel like forever Instagram's been saying, we're gonna remove the like button, we're gonna remove the like button, but like nothing has actually happened. Yes. Because it's really not incentivized to change, right? What totally. is that about? Like, can, can you know, do you think that they're gonna change? Is there anything we can do as consumers to make them change? Or is that like a lost cause? I think they can change, but I think it's gonna take a real regulatory shift that I hope is driven by 
um, consumers that are passionate about seeing that change. You know, we've seen some changes already in our government. Lena Khan, you know, for instance, coming in at the FTC, um, you know, other perspectives certainly shifting, you know, both candidates um, for president in 2020, um, both of them agreed that things need to change on social media. So this is perhaps in a, in a very polarizing world today, one of the few issues that you know, people on both sides of the aisle can can come to some agreement on. Um, so I think that there is some hope for change there, but I don't think that it's going to make all the difference, right? Um, because at the end of the day, the internet is huge. Um, our regulatory potential is relatively limited, right? Um, it, it cannot be perfectly controlled, um, nor do I think that we necessarily want it to be, right? I mean, there have been incredible movements that have also been started on the internet, like hashtag me too, Black Lives Matter movement, and so many others, right? And that was, you know, because of all of these voices stepping into the fold, um, speaking truth. And so I, I think the the self-regulation approach, right, teaching people to be more intentional and smart is the long-term way um, to shift culture around the internet. And I think just reframing our role in the digital world. No one that I speak to, young people, think of themselves as digital citizens. But that's 100% who we yep, are. They, 100%, right? That that's like, it's, it's almost like as passionate as we get about climate change, about... Yes you know, gun safety, about all the things that are in our, our IRL world that we mm -hmm. want to change. It has to have the same passion and activism in our digital world. But you're right. It's like, that's not, I don't see that at all totally. that much. Totally. totally. Um, we need to reframe that role. We need to reframe that. Yeah, I think that's very powerful. So, you know, as part of that, you, you're, you're, I mean, you're a Girls Who Code alumni, you know, very passionate about diversity and tech and inclusion. You know, why do you care about that? Why does it matter to have more women, more people of color in tech? Yeah, I mean, being a Girls Who Code alumni and also having been a Girls Who Code teacher and having graduated 100 women from my Girls Who Code classes, I mean, I'm passionate about more diversity in tech, both because of the way that I've seen it impacts women and because of what these women do for our society. Teaching these women you know, in our classes, they were so empowered, so confident, so excited, so creative for those two hours that we would meet every Friday afternoon over at the Naperville Public Library. You know, solving you know coding challenges is such an exercise as you've talked about in your TED talk in failure, right? And being able to to conquer that challenge, being able to be a part of the sisterhood, it's incredible for these women. And regardless of whether or not they go on to, to become computer scientists, as I would tell them, um, they are gaining a really valuable skill and hopefully a mindset um, that will always encourage them to speak up, to say something, um, to assert themselves, um, and to not back away from something that they're a little scared of. So that's, I mean, you know, one personal reason. Then, of course, there are all these amazing ideas they come up with, and often ideas that I don't see. You know, I, I've met with lots of really impressive technologists. I've been on a lot of panels. I've met with a lot of really experienced folks in the space, and these young women just have the most amazing ideas that no one else has ever thought of. Often they're focused on trying to tackle problems that other people are not experiencing, right? Problems that are specific to their community as women, to their identity as people of color. They're seeing these problems that the rest of us don't focus in on um, and they're creating amazing solutions to tackle them. So I think that is really the broader point about why I think diversity in tech is so important. Yeah. Tech has so many issues today and the world has so many issues today and sometimes tech's trying to solve them, sometimes tech's looking inward and trying to solve its own problems. I think one huge gap is we don't have enough people representing our whole diverse society, thinking about how technology is affecting all of those diverse groups and thinking about how different problems in society are affecting all of these diverse groups. Yeah. At the end of the day, they have the insight, they have the perspective to craft solutions that can really help these communities, but we can't have those solutions if we don't invite them into the space and give them the power and the seat at the table that they deserve. I mean, two questions on that too. Did you Do you feel like in the, in the 10 years since you got engaged with Girls Coach and now that there's actually been a cultural change, that more young women are interested and that it's less um, I don't know there's lots of a stigma or a you know uh, you know the Barbie doll who hates math right that we're actually changing on that and I mean the second piece is, is as as you've continued to be committed to your you know to your to continue to be committed to being a woman in STEM you know what helped you stick with it what you know because there's so many forces that push young women out yes. and so what built your resolve yeah, so I mean, for the first question, has there been a cultural shift? I mean, I would say absolutely, just based off of what I've seen. You know, I just graduated from college, and it is amazing how many women who are graduating with degrees in computer science or engineering are using the hashtag, hashtag women in STEM, 
And that has become cool. That's become a symbol of empowered women who are excited about technology. And that is totally not something that we had five, six, seven, ten years ago, right? So how amazing, right, that we've really reframed the narrative such that women are really proud to identify in this community. And I think there's this broader sisterhood. Um, even if you haven't met a woman, um, if you get to know her instantly and she's in STEM, boom, you know, that that is an amazing link. So I think there has been that cultural change. Um, the second question you asked about, um, gosh, I'm blanking. You had asked about. Like what, how, how, how did you maintain how did I stick through it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. How did I stick through it? I mean, I think it was a combination of things. I think one was being a little angry or keeping my frustration with the status quo close to my heart. Part of that is the status quo with gender diversity in tech and wanting to really, you know, break that status quo and, and reshape the narrative. Part of it was, you know, cyberbullying and the status quo, all the, you know, the hate and harassment that we saw online. Um, and so I think sometimes it's important to keep that why really close to you, um, you know, when you get into the space, because I think, you know, as, as you point out, amidst all the noise, it can be easy to lose that. So trying to keep that close. And I think the other thing is just the sisterhood. I mean, I said that word so many times, but it's so true. Um, you know, for me, a huge part of what's kept me in STEM is just the amazing women and people of color that I've met. And we all come together, we all work together, we all support one another, and we uplift one another. They're also really amazing allies, right, that are constantly encouraging and pushing us. I had a professor in college, a CS professor, um, you know, who would only, he would only have, you know, female TFs. Um, he had a majority female classroom. His name? his name is Jim Waldo. He's amazing. Yeah, he's great. You know, do you know Jim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's great. great. He pointed out our freshman year that, you know, advisors were recommending that women not take CS classes yeah. um, and that it was happening in a biased way because they thought that women couldn't handle these classes. And so he pushed for every woman who expressed CS that joins Harvard to always have a female advisor. Um, and so those kinds of allies, you know, the, the kind of community that I've seen come together around that mission, that has definitely strengthened my resolve. What do you, I mean, going through Harvard and CS, what, do, or, you know, what do you think needs to change though? What could be an accelerator to, you know, that institutions can actually do? And maybe not Harvard, but in your high school and your, you know, all, all of it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's tricky, right? Because part of it, I think has to do with, you know, access for sure. Um, you know, we, we learned during the pandemic that especially, you know, disadvantaged youth in the U.S. didn't even have access to the Internet, right? <laughs> Forget access to, you know, coding education and the education that they needed. So I think that's definitely part of it. And there are schools like Harvard, you know, for instance, through Harvard X that are making their computer science classes free and accessible to all, which I think is a fantastic first step towards, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully making that education more accessible. But I think it goes deeper. And I think that you you probably agree with me on this because you know, you've written about this in a number of your books. I think we really need to change the way that we're raising and, and talking with girls um, about their abilities, about what they can do, um, about what they're equipped to do. And so I think what you know institutions like Harvard can do is fund that research. But you know, I, I'm always I'm always brought back to, I think this is an anecdote. It was either in your TED talk or it was in your book of you know the mom who encouraged her son you know to go down the slide and said you can do yeah. it you can do it but when the you know when her daughter got to the top of the slide and she didn't want to do it she said oh that's okay you don't have to do it don't worry you know and i and i think you know we need to really really go you know go back and really reconsider like how we're raising our kids and what we're teaching them they're capable of because yeah. when you're in, in elementary school as i was so many kids love science girls and you know girls and boys love science love technology and then we get to middle school and it's like boom you know, all of a sudden that interest is gone. And so um, I think, you know, higher education is important, but I think, you know, as girls who code, you know, clearly yeah. is living proof of, we need to start earlier and we need yeah. to really think about how we're changing norms and the way that we're raising our youth. Well, I'm also fascinated as I watch your careers, you enter these kind of very powerful spaces, like, you know, your Rhodes Scholarship, you went through Harvard. I think, you know, I think part of the interesting thing to think about is also like, how do we basically, I don't know, like throw the entire women's empowerment space in the garbage, right? And 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 like, you know, it's 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 interesting. I mean, 72% of women are are high school valedictorians. They're the majority of those that graduate in college, yes. the majority of PhDs, the majority of master's degrees. But somehow when they get into workplaces, you know, and sometimes in higher education, by the time they come out, they say, gosh, you know, do I belong here? Yeah. Or am I good enough? Am I prepared enough? And we're doing that to them. 
because we're telling them, oh, read the confidence code, you know, do a power pose before you start a meeting. Yeah. Like, yeah. And just, you know, learn how, you know, like lean in harder. And so everything that we're, you know, we're saying to women is basically making them feel like, well, the reason why they may feel this moment, you know, that they're not prepared is because there's something wrong with you, not wrong with society yes. or the structure. You know, yeah. I was thinking about it um, at Harvard, for example, you know, what's so fascinating is, uh, you know, in STEM classes, when you have a group project, the men decide to work together. And what do the women do? They work by themselves oh, mm -hmm. because they feel like if they ask a question, they're immediately judged. Yes. And if we could shift that, you know, and actually teach women in many ways to just just recognize you got this, you, you know, yes. you're, you're good enough and yes. stop. And I, listen, I'm guilty of this every time. I, you know, I put on a girl boss teacher. I'm basically saying I'm not a boss and I have to remind myself by wearing this t-shirt that I am. Yes. And, and so all of, and we got it so wrong and I'm part of this, like, you know, we got all of this so wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really have an entirely different playbook in how we're approaching this. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I think back to, I was at a, the New York um, hall of science museum. I was at an event in late April and we were just talking about like, how can we get women to be as confident and self-assured and, and in some sense, you know, even as cocky, you know, as the, yeah. <laughs> as the men who walk into, you know, conference rooms and, you know, as you, as you write about, you know, barely know a fraction of, you know, often what yeah. the women in the room know, but, but just come in with the air of I'll figure it out. I got this. I have the know-how I am capable. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. And so there's clearly, there needs to be a shift there because, yeah. um, to me, they were confident, but then we told them to be nice and sweet and cute. Exactly. We never had, you know, we never, we never, um, you know, we've always been taught to be modest and to, and, and to basically hide our ambition. And then we want, then when you're older, like, oh, no, 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 be ambitious. Yeah. And it's, it's all these, and whether we just leave, leave them alone, you know, yeah. when they're, when they're young and let them be who they are. Totally. Um, you know, you, you said earlier that you're, you're seeing all these nine-year-olds with smartphones terrifies me. My son's seven and I'm like, I'm never giving him a phone. But <laughs> is that the advice? Like, what is, what is the advice for, for parents not to give them devices, to, to give them devices and teach them how to use it? What's the age? What, what do you think? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think the not give them a phone, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tempting, you know, and talking to parents, I know that, but it's also, you know, as you probably know, not very realistic. You know, I got my phone pretty early on because both my parents worked and they needed some way to communicate with me because um, I would be, you know, home alone after school. Um, and so, you know, a lot of parents are, you know, it's, it's often, you know, a fifth grade graduation gift. You know, a lot of parents are getting, you know, their, their kids' phones pretty early. I would say there's no one right age. I would say to the extent possible, um, you know, that you have the privilege to do so, hold off. Um, and your kid will, will maybe hate you now, but thank you for it later. Um, because as you get older and as you think about how that affects how you see things, how you see yourself, body image, especially for women, anxiety, um, you know, social media did not give me all the things that, you know, as a young person thinking it was so cool, I thought it would. So, you know, my advice there is wait as long as you can, but if you have to give them a phone, there's nothing wrong per se with that. But I think as you point out, um, having conversation and education with them is key. Um, so the statistic I think in the US is that one out of 10 youth will tell an adult when they're cyberbullied. So 90% will not tell anyone, including their parents, which is really shocking. And you know, research finds is often attributed to a lack of dialogue, right? So parents not really actively when they're handing over the phone, you know, having conversation about expectations, rules, you know, um, you know what the phone means, what the internet means, that, that basic education seems to be missing. So what I recommend to parents is, you know, for the how and the what, on the how side, um, I recommend proactive conversation. So even before they get a phone, even before they're on social media, they're on the internet, talking about the internet, talking about challenges, probing them, asking them questions to solicit their perspective and engaging in conversation with them so you can start to shape and form um, you know, how they're seeing the digital world. The other thing is to have routine check-ins. Um, a lot of parents, their approach with digital parenting is only to ever have a conversation when something goes wrong. Um, I think that that can often be something that deters youth from, you know, having the conversation when something goes wrong. So even if it's like a weekly phone check-in, you know, that's something I've seen implemented super successfully with lots of parents. Just once a week, you know, you come together, you talk about the phone, maybe you're evaluating rules or privileges that have been set. That's just a really great way to create, you know, transparency and dedicated space for conversation about the phone, about the internet. In terms of the what, I always recommend parents don't shy away from the scary. 
Um, I think a lot of parents, for instance, are, you know, afraid to dive into topics like sexting, you know, very taboo. I just don't want to talk about it. It's, you know, it's so like, I don't want to have that conversation. But the reality is in the U.S., one out of 12 youth are having sex that they've sent forwarded on without their consent. And the majority of those are women. Right. And we already know the. At what age, you know? Um, I mean, the most common age is 16, I think, which is, I mean, shocking, right? I mean, it's, 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 and so, but it's happening younger and younger. I mean, I visit schools, I talk with, um, you know, educators and parents and, you know, there are like, you know, even 11 and 12 year old girls that this is happening to. And so it's, you know, we already know the internet is so toxic for our women. Um, and then we have this, you know, compounding that. So I just encourage parents to not shy away from that scary stuff so that, if your child ever finds themselves in that kind of situation, they're not afraid to come and talk to you about what's happening. They know um, that that's something that you know about, um, that it has been destigmatized, that it's not taboo, that you are a resource for them. And then finally, I just always encourage parents to make space. Have them you know, be able to express their perspective, have them be able to ask questions. It should never just be, these are the rules and I said so. Try and really make it a dialogue and, and explain why. I mean, this is just for me, you know, reflecting back on my youth, you know, the rules I always respected as a child were the ones that I felt like my parents had well justified. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the ones that were just kind of arbitrary thrown out there, I was kind of like, eh, I'm not sure that I, I really buy this. And, I, you know, it's, it's certainly the case with the phone because um, you can't watch it all the time. You can't monitor it all the time. Um, so if you're not giving your child the space to express their viewpoint, um, you know, that, that makes it really easy for them to kind of go off in their Should own Did you be monitoring it? Like reading their apps, reading their texts, going through it? Fine. Yeah. It's a tricky question. I mean, I've seen parents do all sorts of things. I've seen people do a random check like once a week or once a month, um, which I think, you know, that could be a strong way to start. Um, and then, you know, if they're, you know, engaging in behavior that's appropriate, they're not breaking the rules, you reward them by, right, by doing it less frequently. Um, I, I think there are also ways, of course, to like approve app purchases, monitoring technology. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it has some pros. I think that there are some approaches, but, but honestly, I mean, I think it's more important that you show your child that you trust them and you teach them. I think if you do the trust and teach approach, um, that's the best approach because at the end of the day, you know, one day they're going to graduate and go off to school, <laughs> you know, and, and the behaviors that they've learned are the ones that are going to stick with them, right? Good or bad. And so obviously it's a little scary. And I think, especially when they're starting off, there's definitely some room for monitoring. Certainly as they're getting on new social media apps, definitely room for monitoring. I think clear rules and, you know, punishments for breaking those rules, definitely appropriate. Um, but I don't know that, you know, getting on there and reading their texts every night is, is going to do, do so much to help them learn the skills that they need to be good people. People, right online and in person so are there like common misconceptions you receive about your work in in the digital world or for, for internet safety are there things that people are just so wrong like we're so wrong about in in terms of our preconceived notions yeah i mean i think one big one is i mean for me personally is people think i don't like technology um because i'm an anti-hate activist you know they think i'm one of those people like ah just miss the good old days when we didn't have technology that's the the root cause of this problem, not realizing that I am a technologist. Um, you know, I love technology. I think it has so much power to do so much good in the world. Um, and yet, I just think it's important that we educate youth about how to use it. Part of that is equipping them with the skills, right, to be able to create the things that they want. That's the work that Girls Who Code is doing. I think that's so important. Part of it also is teaching them just to be digitally literate and responsible, right? I mean, we teach kids about so many other things, drug use, um, you know, even bullying in classes, but we don't really teach them about this thing called the internet. We just kind of throw them out there and say, okay, figure it out. Um, and so that that's, you know, that's my stance, but it's interesting how many people assume that I might be anti-tech and I am not in any way. What, what do you think the role of free speech is here? Like, should we be re regulating content should, or the, or should, I mean, I, I have lot of different perspectives here because I, I, it's so interesting. Like I feel like the young people, your generation, you're so freaking smart. Like, you're <laughs> so smart. And, you know, I, it's, I, you know, I'm not, I, I feel like in many ways, I trust you to figure out the truth and you may be actually much more discerning, you know, than we mm -hmm. were. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, in terms of free speech, right, it's worth situating where the U.S. stands relative to the rest of the world, right? Because we have a First Amendment. You know, Europe does not. Free speech is a really important principle in Europe, but there is no First Amendment there. And the result of that is they tend to more adopt the regime <laughs> of we would much rather have less speech, um, but more diverse speakers, 
um, than we would, as we do in the US, have more speech, but often fewer speakers because some of that speech is excluding other speakers, right? In other words, they champion diversity and inclusivity of speech over you know, the, the amount, and we tend to champion the amount over the diversity and inclusivity. And so that in some ways limits us a little bit. Um, in other ways, it helps us, right? Because it, it, speech is you know, a bedrock principle of the US, it's important, right? So, um, but that limits us a little bit in terms of regulation, right? So I don't think the solution is for Congress to say, you know, this type of speech is allowed or that type of speech is allowed. It's not legal, it's not gonna work, it's not constitutional, it's gonna be you know, struck down in a heartbeat. I think where regulation can play a role is just better understanding, you know, what's happening um, in these social media companies. You know, I think about the Facebook files and so much that we learned from Francis Haugen. I think it would be great if, you know, for instance, social media companies were required to submit reports to Congress and had to testify more regularly and researchers had access to data to actually understand how these algorithms are working, right? Because we might trust this generation to be a little bit more discerning, right? Having lived more of their life on the internet, understanding perhaps a little bit more than older generations that you know, not everything you see on the internet is true, but um, you know, if our algorithms are getting smarter and smarter at manipulating them, how long does that solution last, right? And so part of that is just getting into the weeds and really understanding what's happening right behind the scenes at Meta, Twitter, yeah. whatever. Um, and so I think that there are, you know, roles for Congress to help, you know, play the role of like, let's understand, you know, what's happening and then legislate, right, accordingly, based off of what's possible legally. That's really the solution that I advocate, because I, I agree with you. I think that um, this generation, you know, more so than other generations, understands both the, the pluses and the limits <laughs> of yeah. the internet. Um, so I think we just need to figure out how we can use legislation to ensure that that solution actually sticks. Right. I mean, I think the mental health crisis is a great example of this. Like, had we actually had the data mm -hmm. of Instagram, we could have seen the crisis coming much earlier and done Absolutely. something about it. And you yep. want social media companies to say, oh, well, I don't like what I'm seeing here, mm -hmm. you know, and have this kind of public responsibility as, as citizens, you know, to, to, to basically not want to do harm. Um, so, you know, so interesting. So I grew up, I didn't have a phone until I was in law school. Wow. Uh, not great. <laughs> oh so I, it's wild, but like I, I remember before and I remember, remember it after. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we didn't, ha you know, our lives weren't fully documented, you know what yeah. I mean? Until I was mm -hmm. 25. Yeah. Uh, where, and, and so what, how would you rather have lived like me or like you? And like, what would you tell your younger self? Would you have gotten a phone later? Would you have gotten online later? Would you have gotten on earlier? Would you like, what would you have, what would you do differently? Yeah. Um, gosh, that's tricky. I, I think I would have lived as I am now, but I think I would have gone back and told my younger self, Photoshop is a thing, touch-ups are a thing. The things that you're seeing on Instagram are not real. That's not what women's bodies actually look like. Um, I would have gotten on social media later. I would have gotten a phone later if I could have. Um, I, I think there, the reason I say that I would have stuck with my time period is just because the internet for me has been at times, uh, you know, a place of negativity, but it's also been this place that has inspired me, um, you know, and, and pushed me to, you know, pursue causes that I'm passionate about and connect with activists and, and be able to read in real time from people that inspire me like you, you know what I mean? I, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, continue to, to hear about your work and all the amazing things you're doing if I didn't, you know, follow you on Twitter and, and get to see, you know, all the work that you're doing. And I've met so many amazing people online. I've had incredible experiences online and it's wonderful, you know, to keep in touch with my friends. I've graduated college now. I'm thinking how on earth without a phone, you know, <laughs> you know, in what world would I be able to talk with them every day and connect with them every day? You know, you know, and so I, I don't take those those pluses for granted, but I think that so much of what we see on the internet, especially for young people, when you are less discerning um, at, a, at a very young age, is altered and you know at times manipulative. And as a young person, I didn't really know at times where those lines were, and that affected how I saw myself. It affected how I saw the world. So I think I would have just waited to get on later when I when I had more of that discerning eye of okay, I am a little bit more comfortable and confident knowing this is real and this is, this is not. <laughs> yeah. I think the thing I think about with web three that scares me is mm -hmm. this kind of, you know, as, as I've been talking to different entrepreneurs that who are designing, you know, clothing for their avatars, Yes, you know, and that we're basically, and, and, or even now people who don't want, you know, like the way they look on zoom or filtered or online and now are afraid to meet people in person because they don't think they look the same. Yeah. 
And, and so we're, we're spent a lot of time on our digital selves and the perfection of our digital selves, yep. um, which is a little dangerous. And totally. I don't, and I think it's gotten, you know, it's gotten, I see that myself. I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> okay. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't have, you know, it's yep. we're so much more um, critical. Totally. Uh, of our real see it on dating apps too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, I mean, we didn't have any of that. So yeah. it's, it was so, so, I mean, I grew up, I met my husband at a bar, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. In, in, and completely differently. It's very, it's very interesting. Um, so what is your favorite app right now? My favorite app right now is probably, I'd have to say either Headspace or Insight Timer, just because. Oh, what's Insight Timer? Insight Timer is like a free version of Headspace. So okay. if you are on a budget, if you're a student, um, it's a great app. Um, and it, the, re the thing I really like about it is it has such a diversity of different types of meditations, right? So there are like the more conventional meditations, but then there are also like stories or even just like phrases that you can repeat to yourself. And for me, it's just been a busy month. And so I, I really tried to, try to ground myself as much as I possibly can and you know, kind of start the day with some sort of intention, but also to your point, give my space, give myself the space to know that things will turn out how things will turn out. It's not all on me to make it perfect. Yeah. I want to encourage everybody. It's 840. We're going to put, we're taking questions from the audience. So throw them in the chat. Um, um, we have a, we have a, something from um, Angela. Your, she was your middle school librarian. Ah. And she said, you know, I'm so sorry that you were going through this in our building. What can we do as staff members to stop online bullying? Great question. That's a, it's a great question. And I just, you know, want to say it's, it's an unfair burden to a lot of educators today that this really falls on them, especially as digital education has taken off. Increasingly, we're seeing cyberbullying that isn't just on personal devices, but on school devices. And so suddenly, you know, it's become really the role of the teacher to be, you know, both the educator and at times the parent. Um, I think one really powerful thing to do is just to work with the schools, um, and I've seen this in a lot of really great schools, to figure out how digital literacy education can be implemented into curriculum. Um, sometimes it's part of a health class, sometimes it's part of a homeroom, sometimes it's just an event, right, that happens during October, for instance, which is anti-bullying month, just a chance to introduce youth to key concepts like you know, digital citizenship, or even what cyberbullying is, or to get into some of those scary topics, the way we do, you know, when we talk about drug overdose, for instance, in middle school or high school, right, the goal there is to really, you know, give you that exposure, and I think that that exposure for the internet is key too. The other thing I think is just um, having youth-led bodies, um, setting an example, this is something that I've really tried to spearhead through my work with Rethink, is empowering chapters of youth within schools to push for this message, because the number one role model that youth love our fellow youth, right? Those are the people that they respect, they look up to, and they're much more willing to take, you know, a call to action from. And so if there's any way to create, you know, bullying, you know, leadership council, for instance, and bring youth onto that and have them play a really active role in what's happening in the school, that can be a really great way to have youth say, oh, okay, this is something that, you know, is, is really important. Maybe something that I should consider and seriously think about. Um, question here from Olivia. You're so inspiring. Speaking of apps you were just talking about, do you have a saying or a motto you tend to tell yourself or one that really resonates with you? Mm, gosh. I mean, I have a couple. One is one is stolen from Rashma, which is to be brave, not perfect, which I, it, for me, like my entire career has just been like risk after risk after risk. And I've been afraid every time, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's baked into me. And, you know, we talked about you know, early on, the fact that we are guilty of it too. I want to be good at what I do. You know, I want to be good at what I do because what I do, I feel like really matters and I want to do it right for the people that I'm trying to serve. Um, but throughout my career, I've had to take a lot of risks. I've had to pivot. I've had to consider new spaces. And through it all, I've just had to, you know, really tell myself like, what do you have to lose? You know what I mean? Go for it, be brave, do it, do the thing. Um, so I think that has been one really key motto. Um, I think another really key motto for me is take care of yourself. Um, I think this generation, one thing that we do really well is we emphasize and we prioritize self-care and there's a real dialogue about the value of self-care, um, not just, you know, to make us more productive, um, you know, employees or better students, but to make us more whole people. Um, so I'm constantly telling myself to take care of myself, to take a break, to stop. If I'm feeling frustrated, I've really gotten into um, you know, the habit of just putting the laptop down and saying, I'm done, <laughs> done for the day. I don't care. Um, and I think that has been, has been really huge for me. 
Um, and then I think one other one other motto is just to um, to be empathetic and loving and caring of all of the people around me. Um, that includes people that um, you know um, sometimes I disagree with, um, but I try to to adopt the most restorative perspective that I can. Um, I try to do that, um, and I do it solely with the purpose of advancing my <laughs> my agenda and my mission and what I believe is right. Uh, but I think by being empathetic and by being caring, I can't tell you how many people have you know have been you know in in my activism and my work have been touched by the fact that um, I chose to be kind to them and have been willing to lend a year um, and have been willing to support me, have been willing to even shift a perspective or a position. Um, because I, you know, went in there wanting to do what I wanted to do, but wanting to treat them as whole. Um, so I think that's another motto. That what has been your biggest failure? Because when I, when I look at you, I feel like, you, like, you know, hmm. people say this to me, like, it feels like you've had, but you've just been, you've been so <laughs> blessed, right? Yeah. But we know, we always know that that's not true. So what, what is something that you really struggled with or didn't work out for you or you were disappointed by? Yeah. Um, Gosh, I mean, there are so I mean, there are so many awards I've applied to that I haven't gotten. Things that you know, that, all sorts of things that I could I could go on and on about. But um, I mean, one that really stands out to me is over the last two to three years, we've been working on making Rethink available in international languages, and so we've been trying to expand to global audiences. And that's in recognition of the fact that technology use is no longer just concentrated in the U.S. and Western Europe. It's it's now very much something that people around the world have access to. And one big way that, you know, that, that I failed was, was really in, you know, the creation and the rollout of that technology. It was stalled. It took much longer than we thought because I went in and I really underestimated the extent to which context was going to be 100% key here. Cyberbullying as it occurs in the U.S. is so different from cyberbullying as it occurs in Lebanon, right? It's just, it's so different. And it's not yeah. just a matter of cracking the dialect. It's not just a matter of crafting the linguistics to create the best technology. It's also about like, how do you introduce this movement in a completely different place? How do you introduce this movement and make it the same kind of impactful and meaningful in a completely different place? And I was a little naive and <laughs> I was very aggressive and I kind of fell flat on my face um, a couple of times with partners that I was hoping to connect with, with uh, people that I was hoping to reach. And so now finally this summer, we are bringing Rethink in Lebanese to Lebanon, but that was after three years. Um, and what I had originally thought was gonna be a nine month, <laughs> a nine month project. So, yeah. Um, great question here from Kristen. She said, you know, there's so many stories about adults behaving badly on, on social media. How do you inspire kids to act, act responsibly when they don't have the best role models around them? Yeah, I mean, to me, this is the most disappointing and it's the most frustrating um, because it is so hard to tell youth, oh, be the best version of yourself online, be kind online when you have, um, you know, everyone from politicians, um, you know, to business, to business people um, saying some of the most horrible things um, on the internet. Um, so it's one of my my biggest pet, pet peeves, I guess, you know, not my pet peeves, I mean, I guess just one of my biggest frustrations um, with this work. But one thing I try to encourage youth is this is an amazing way to flip the script because often youth are told, you know, when we think about problems, especially that are attributed to young people like cyberbullying, ah, that's just kids these days. You know, kids these days, they're just, they're out of control. You know, it's the internet making them crazy. And, you know, they're, they you know, they're, they're horrible. You know, they've become so cruel. And I, I tell kids, this is such a great way to flip the narrative, right? And, and remind, you know, the older people in your life that, that you're better, right, than, um, than what society tells you that you are. Um, and so I, I try and, um, you know, and impress that on them. The other thing I say is just like, you know, we need to, we are the future adults, right? So we need to set the standard for what we want this world to look like, right? I'm, I'm 22. I'm really on the cusp of what will be, you know, a long adult life as are so many of my friends. Middle age, you're hitting middle oh, age. Yay. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we are the future. And so it's not, an excuse for us to say, oh, well, today's adults are doing it. Well, we are tomorrow's adults. Um, and so what we do and, you know, uh, the, the standards that we choose to, uh, you know, adopt are going to be the future. Um, and so that, that's what I try and tell youth is like, you're a young person today, but you won't be tomorrow and tomorrow you'll have kids. Um, and so the standards you adopt for yourself today are, are the ones that they're going to adopt tomorrow. So two questions here. What are you most excited about and what's next in your journey? 
Uh, I'm excited about a lot. Um, I am really blessed and privileged. Last year I was named a Rhodes Scholar, so I'll be off to graduate school in the fall at Oxford. So I'm excited for that. Um, It's going to be a lot of fun and I think a great learning experience. And I've never really lived outside of the U.S. for a long period, so I think that will be fun. And I know family is using this as an excuse to come visit as much as they can. So So your parents are moving in with you. Yeah, so (laughs) I'm excited for that. Um, and then I think it was the next question, what's next in your journey? Yeah, so that's... That's kind of that. That's kind of that. I mean, I think hopefully we'll continue to, to work on Rethink and um, you know, p- also push more broadly into activism. Um, personally, I'm really interested in pushing more broadly into activism around stigma. Um, that has to do with mental health and cyberbullying, just because that's been such a huge impediment to this work um, over the last 10 years, particularly as we've, we've gone global. Um, it's been really interesting to see how those perspectives come back and can be really frustrating barrier with which to do this work. So that's definitely something I'm very excited about. So we didn't talk too much directly about your book. Did you enjoy writing it? How was the <laughs> process? Would you recommend it? Is this your first book, last book? Like, tell that's- us a little bit about it. Yeah, so Rethink the Internet is a collection of funny fictional stories um, that impart key digital literacy concepts to readers. So each chapter features a digital literacy lesson, and in the story, fictional characters navigate some sort of tricky situation on the internet, and the reader ultimately comes to the lesson. They then have the chance to complete an internet challenge where they can put what they've learned into practice on their social media or on their phone, um, and it comes with a companion guide so that you know educators and parents can read the book with a child and can you know ask reflection questions, can help support them as they complete the challenges, um, and so on. So that's the book. I loved writing it. Um, it I actually wrote it the most of it during the pandemic. And so it was kind of perfect timing for me because I was alone. I had thought I was gonna be at college. Instead, I was back in my parents' house in Naperville. Um, and you know, the world seemed to be um, on fire and crumbling around me. And I was um, you know, looking for something to put something positive um, and put my creative energy towards. And this happened to, to come along right at that very moment. And so um, it was really fun to write because it was a culmination of so many years of wanting to, you know, take these concepts and lessons and make them fun and make them interesting for youth and create this book that I had kind of had in my head for a long time. And so it was a really positive, bright spot in, in what was a what was a difficult time for, for a lot of folks. Um, so I loved it and I would highly recommend it. <laughs> now you've been working on this issue for pretty much since you were 12. Yes. Um, why do you, what is it? Why? I mean, and it's interesting because for me, when I was 13 is when I led my first march. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting how when you find something when you're young and for whatever reason, it just, and I feel like that's what this issue is for you. Yes. What what do you, what's your kind of uh, analysis about that? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think when you're young and you find an issue that you really care about, and more importantly, that you feel like your voice can be super additive towards, it is life-changing. And for me, I think that is what it was, was there were so many adults doing work on cyberbullying when I was 12 or 13. And I just thought they just don't get it. They just don't understand our lived experience. And I want to be that voice that changes the way that we're tackling this. And so I think when you're a young person, and especially when you see a status quo, there's just something so exciting. You realize your voice can be a difference maker. There's just something so exciting um, and so much potential you know, in that and about that. I think that's part of the reason we need to tell youth more that their voices can be groundbreaking because I was really lucky to have a teacher that said, go for it, to have parents that said, go for it, to have friends that said, hey, that's really cool. You should do this. Um, but a lot of youth, you know, often have their voices dismissed, right, or don't have that seat at the table um, and or don't have, you know, the opportunity to march or, you know, whatever it might be. And so I think, um, you know, reminding them that their voices can be groundbreaking, because I think that's what it was for me, like thinking I could be groundbreaking, never once having ever thought that in my life before, just thought, oh, I'm a 13 year old kid. What can I do? You can do a lot. You know, it turns out you can do so much. And yeah. I think a lot of you don't realize that. Yeah. You're never too young to make the risk. And I have been thinking about this, especially right now. I actually think and I love your perspective on this too. It's like, it feels like there's voice, young people's voices are missing right now. You know, we went through that kind of Malala, Greta, you know, the March for Lives kit. And now it feels like ever since then, there's been this real void. void. Yeah. Why? What do you think that's about? 
I mean, I think part of it is frustration from the youth perspective. You know, I think about, you know, March for Our Lives, for instance, or even, you know, Greta Thunberg giving all of these speeches, advocating for change, and then the adults in the room not, <laughs> not doing anything, right? So I think part of it is frustration from the youth perspective. I think part of it also is systematic effort to shut out youth perspectives. You know, I, I think about, you know, things like, you know, gun control. Um, this is a problem that, you know, I, I was in an elementary school today and I, I could feel the way that last week's shooting affected everyone there, you know, and it was just heartbreaking to me because that is not how I felt when I went to elementary school. And to think that that is the way that our youth are being raised today. I mean, it's just like, it breaks my heart. Um, but the point is, I think that sometimes we shut voices out, right? We want to bring the experts in or just the adults in, or, you know, we focus on policymakers or we're held hostage, right? By policymakers right now, 90% of Americans think that universal background checks are a good idea, but we are held hostage, right? By, um, by, by, by senators. And so I think that that's part of it. Um, I think also part of it for sure is, you know, there's been a huge gap during the pandemic with youth. So many youth are just struggling to catch up. Uh, you know, forget, you know, pursue their dreams or think about inventions that they can create. And so we have a lot of lost ground to make up for. That's really, that's really powerful. And I think that that's very true. And like any functioning society, I think, especially in America, we need our young people to help, you know, to basically keep us honest and real and to heal us and to save us. And I know it's a big ask, but I think that's why I've spent so much of my life, you know, activating young people because yes. Yes. You know, and I, 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 and you're right. And this is why the pandemic, I think, is so frustrating because it, it, we did really, really set back. Yes. You know, the, and we need that. We need those voices right now. I mean, so what do you feel like? You know, maybe to close on this, it's you are one of those voices. You know, you are one of the voices of your generation. What do you need from the adults in the room? You know, what I mean, to basically be successful in making change. I mean, I think the number one thing that we need is power. Um, so we need not just performance, but power. So much of what a lot of the adults in the room are doing right now is so performative. You know, it's in, inviting them to the table, but not really giving them a seat, giving them a seat, but not really giving them a voice. So I think we need power. Um, I think that that is so, so key. Um, I think the other thing that we need is, you know, unequivocal support, you know, that means funding, um, you know, that means, uh, you know, putting, putting, you know, your voices behind us, um, not just when it's convenient, but, but when it's, you know, different, when it's completely out there and something that's totally radical that you've never heard of, um, but, but putting your back and your support behind us is so key because we, we are, you know, the future and we are radical and we are different, but that's how change happens. Um, and so many actors wait until it's comfortable. <laughs> um, and that's often when we least need you, right? We need you when we're starting out and we really are breaking the status quo and we're looking for someone to lead with us into the future, right? Looking for someone to say, you know, it's not enough to just ask women to lean in, right? Lots of, com you know, companies are comfortable saying that. We need companies that are willing to say, it's not okay to not pay women for the emotional labor, um, you know, that they're putting on the table each and every day. So I think that that is, that that is huge. And so I would just love to see more adults giving us power and really stepping up for us, you know, even when it's not a hundred percent accepted or it's not a hundred percent comfortable, or it hasn't become, you know, um, you know, uh, culturally okay yet, you know, when you see someone doing the right thing, we need you to be there with us saying that this is the right thing um, because yeah. that's how we push into the future. You know, la swear, last, last thing. The <laughs> one thing that to leave you with for you to think about is that, you know, I think pretty soon about 70% of our population is going to live into 10 to 12 states. And so the entire political process that we have with the House, it's going to be broken because yeah. we're going to be run by minority rule, not majority rule. And so it's not going to be political, I suspect, not political institutions that actually solve problems. It's going to be everybody that's outside of the political system, you know, and that's you, and that's the work that you're doing. And so I think we need to make sure that we continue to seed. Sometimes we say, well, run for office. Yeah. You know, that's what I was told, right? And, that's, yeah. and it's actually not enough. You know what I mean? Start yeah. a company, build a social entrepreneurship, right? You know, have an idea. Like build a nonprofit, like right there, there's going to be other ways yes. that is actually going to save us and save our democracy than potentially our political process. Because again, the way that it's set up, we're not going to have rule by majority. Um, and it's something that we need to really think about, you yes. know, 
as we're, as we're thinking about what our institutions look like. 100%. So, yes. Well, thank you so much. I see, I see Jenny popping back in here. I'm so proud of you. Uh, we're so lucky, you know, yeah. you know, God bless you. We're so lucky to have you and your leadership and your thank you to your parents you know, for, I would be half as lucky to have one of my sons turns out half as you. Um, and so um, keep going and we're behind you all the way. Thank you, Reshma. I mean, I have to thank you because I've sent you a million and a half emails over the last 10 years from the day I started to now. And you always respond. You're always there for me. So many people say that they are an agent for change for young people, but you really are the real deal. You've been a mentor. You've been instrumental um, and helping me reach my dreams and goals. And so thank you for, for, you know, for I'll doing, for doing it. <laughs> well, thank you to both of you. I love that we sort of ended on, on how this and how each of us can, can save the democracy. Um, and that does, it makes this feel even more so timely, um, you know, beyond this very large problem that really does impact everything else of, of the internet and cyberbullying and, and that, I'm not I'm putting that in too small of a nutshell, but you know that does impact everything else we do. And so I, I very much appreciate that the two of you ended on that note. Um, so thank you so much um, for saving, for, for sharing your time with us this evening. Uh, Trisha, congratulations on all of your accomplishments, recent and past, and the book. I mean, that's you know why we're here. Um, and uh, Rachma from for joining us as well um, from New York. So um, to everyone else who is joining with us today, thank you so much. Um, I hope you all leave as inspired as I feel. I was texting with someone else who's on the call who said that Trisha's going to save the world. And I said, well, if we're lucky, um, <laughs> you and voices like yours and all of you watching can be those voices as well. So we thank you for sharing your time. Um, I, I will just note, considering our, our discussion tonight, that actually there was a vigil tonight uh, here in Naperville um, from uh, the tragedy that happened in Texas last week. Um, so even though that, you know, I, I personally was not there working here and on this change um, on these uh, topics does feel like a way to make change as well, of course. So um, thank you for that as well. Um, on a logistical note, if you had a book that came with your ticket tonight, that will either be available for you to pick up or be shipped out to you in the coming days. And we will communicate that with to you as soon as we have that information. Um, but do reach out if you have any questions about that. To everybody out there, be safe. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, happy reading and let's go change the world. Thank you. Good night, everyone.